Riley, Marina Sirtis, Denise Crosby, Jonathan Frakes, Kate McFadden, Rex Stoller, and Wilson Sanchez. You may be wondering what I'm doing here, and so am I, actually. But you have here a disparate group of people who are unmanageable. They're actors, and, and I love actors, filled with personality and dreams and hopes. And We're disparate, as you said. <laughs> And desperate, and all at the same time. Exactly. It's all yeah. like and childish. So all. I'm going to just sort of handle the traffic, and you've got this wonderful group of people to uh, to ask questions of. But I'd like to ask a question. Go ahead, Bill. To start. Please. <clears throat> Do you like touring? Well, like Do you like being on tour? In on tour. I love it. Me too. You love touring, don't you? Oh, that is such a. Are thing. you talking about this kind of gig? No, no. This is like come here, say hello to the people, and go home. <laughs> so, what do you mean by touring? I'm talking about touring, like with yes. <laughs> okay, so those of you who yes, don't know what yes is <laughs> that kind of touring. Yeah, exactly. Well, I was uh, I was listening to Kathy Griffin, yeah, uh, on do. television, and she said, "Well, I did 60 cities." Uh, this last month, and I and I love touring, and I'm thinking I've been on tour a lot, and I hate it. <laughs> well, you you don't have any roots, you don't know anybody, you're alone in the city, you, and and then you keep wondering, will I ever, will I ever be able to live in a city and have have family and have friends? Or, I'm on tour. Will I ever get home again? Will I ever get home again? It's like Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz. Why don't you carry that on? Yeah. This is so sad. <laughs> what a way to start. I love to. I would love to go on tour and be away from home. Now, when you run for office, when I run, yeah, when I run for office, will, I will in fact be on, be on tour. tour. Um, but you know, I've been married with. I've been with my fellow for nearly thirty years, so it's a nice break. <laughs> It's one nice. way to look at and it. When you say being on your own in a city in a beautiful in a beautiful hotel, not some crap Motel Six, you know, but in a beautiful hotel, getting room service, going down to the gym or the pool, Massage. not having to cook or clean, pick up a nice looking man, pick up a nice looking boy toy, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, things things can happen on tour. Oh, you know? yeah, things can and happen. Do. If you're lucky, Often. if you're lucky, things can happen. Maybe we should stuff. tour together. Oh, okay, <laughs> we're, we're on. So, so feeling like differently the, about the touring now? You like you like touring? You feeling a little differently about touring now? Yeah, yeah, I like it. I like it. I, I, like it. I only want to tour. I knew you'd come around. Well, why <clears throat> why don't we start with um, a question for our, uh, the panel? Uh, something that interests is there, you is about. Is there any way for us? Oh, look at that. That's a large audience. Oh, you know, you read my mind. I was just going to ask why should we turn on <laughs> Yes. The group, yes. <laughs> There's a lot of Please, points. go ahead. Hello, captains. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not here to ask a question. I'm here to state a fact. I'm stating a fact of how all of these wonderful people on stage right now changed our lives. Oh. I, don't have any, I don't have any questions for you. I don't want you to wonder why you said this when you were this character or that character, all that other baloney. I want you to know, and I've waited a long time for this. My name is Kevin Gaunt. I am a radiation therapist for the Palo Alto Medical Foundation. I treat 30 or 40 cancer patients a day using a linear accelerator to try to save their lives. And while I do that, I tell them about William Shatner. I tell them about Halo. I 
tell them about Jonathan Frakes. I tell them about all of you. You guys, and I, forgive me. Please, everyone forgive me. God forgive me. Forgive me. Man, I tell you, I'd be very wary of you if I... <laughs> You know what, Bill? You should you should reconsider that because I'm damn good at what I do. I'm damn good at what I do, and I am good because of the influence that you people, through your characters, have given me. No one ever says that. No one comes up here and says, "You guys inspired me. You made me who I am." The characters that you portray. The lines that you have delivered have changed my life. And I base my performance of myself on that performance. And he sounds just like you, Bill. He's stealing my delivery. But you know what? He's, he's, so, he's what? so influenced by you that he's phrasing his sentences now like yeah. that. She's right. She's right. She's right. What do you say? You have cancer. I mean, you don't want to... Good point, good point. I want you to know, too, Bill Shatner, and it's an honor to speak with you finally. I want you to know that the, the, the wonderful music you created with Ben Folds... Oh, don't be ridiculous. I want you to know... I want you to know that the music you created with Ben Folds, I play for my patients and they love it, especially real. Because there's a part of me <laughs> from that guy on that screen. I'm enough, enough. I'm <laughs> anyway, Look, hey, listen, guys, I'll better, get off the stage. But Mr. Gaunt, is it better than Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds? It's about the same. I know. It's about I... the same. It's about the same. Right. Nevertheless, I'll get all off right. the stage. I want to thank all of you for influencing all of us. We're all here. Because of what you have done and the way you delivered it. We love you. You will live forever. Oh my God. And thank you again for your wonderful performances. God bless all of you. Thank you. Good. Yeah, great opening. A great opening. Can anybody top that? No. <laughs> he put his hand up. Maybe hand yeah. up. This is what you, this is... He's, not, he's well done. No. Yeah, he's ready to go, he's ready to go. You're Come following on. an act which isn't, uh, uh, it, it's he's tough. He's going to explain how go they replace Madison Bumgarner. Captain Kirk became a part of Star Trek lore. Oh, here we go. He returned to San Francisco in Star Trek IV. Mr. Shatner, what were your favorite scenes to film in San Francisco for Star Trek IV and the rest of our superb Star Trek panel? What does San Francisco mean to each of you? Oh, okay. Now, let's ask the panel, what does San Francisco mean to you? Until yesterday, it seemed to be a threat. And then Madison Bob Carter went down. Um, to me... For it, months. What did you do? Johnny, I can't hear you. No, John, baseball. What, what, is, what does San Francisco mean to you? I just tried to explain it, but I was... What does it mean? I left my heart in San Francisco. You did. No, I did. To me, it represents the summer of love. Back in the 60s, where the, where the flower power and the peace movement started, and uh, we need to go back to those times, I feel, a little bit. <laughs> Make love not war, that one, yeah. Hey, Ashbury, all that stuff, yeah. But, but does San Francisco have a mystical meaning to any of you? The way the city was founded, the way it, it's a burgeoning uh, artistic place, it's food mecca. Absolutely, I have um, extended family who um, grew up in San Francisco, they go back and I have people who are living there now from my extended family and I visit there a lot. To me, it, it's a place of enormous um, intellectual, political, social activity, which I think is extraordinary. It's got some of the best food commune places to get food that I've ever had. I take it back in my car to LA. Uh, you know, I mean, we're just like ladling peanut butter into these little cans. Um, and I, I mean, it's a food mecca for me. That's the other thing. It, it has people who are really going back to grassroots and 
doing micro things. I love the Mission District, how that's changing. And uh, education, it, there's so many amazing schools. And I think it's a great, great American city. But uh, let me enlarge the question. Brett, do you, do you have a, a favorite city? San Francisco. <laughs> Good answer! And I say that, I say that in my best Blackie Norton voice, because I always think of Clark Gable, Jeanette McDonald, Spencer Tracy, San Francisco. You know that movie? It was a musical, wasn't it? No, no. Well, it was. She sang quite a bit in it. She sang, San Francisco. Oh, you know that song, right? Uh, but when I think about San Francisco, I think about San Jose. And I think about Tony Bennett singing about San Jose. <laughs> the loveliness of Paris. No, I won't do it. It's uh... a... <laughs> Why? But do you have a favorite city? I do. What is it? I love London. Yes! <laughs> I just feel very comfortable in London. And, and pretentious. Which is, uh, <laughs> which is what I'd like to feel. Yeah. Yeah. Pretentious. What about the rest of you? Favorite cities? Favorite cities? London. London. I love London Why? as well, I would say. Why? Oh, my hometown's yeah. getting all the votes. Well, I just... I can that, speak the language. That English... <laughs> makes sort it of. easy. Sort of. No, sort of. you can't spell the language, but you can spell well, the language. Well, no, Dublin, I have trouble spelling, but... but I think uh, London, I uh, English accent is sort of very poshy. No. Come on. <laughs> Well, so <laughs> no, I'm not posh. I'm the opposite of posh. Okay, next question. We need a we need a Star Trek question. Come on. Yeah. No. Oh, hold it. A little test test. Oh, there we go. Hi, y'all. My name's Laura. Um, and I want to ask you guys about Star Trek Discovery, because TNG has a long history of popping up in other TV series, regardless of time. Um, so would you guys be interested in popping up on the new Star Trek series uh, TV show? And if so, what would you have your characters do? Um, I would do it, but um, they'd have to pay me a lot of money to get back in that space too. <laughs> Because I would have to go to the fat farm and lose about 15 pounds. Um, so yeah, I would do it if they paid me a lot of money. Um, and I don't care what she does, I'm an actress, you know, just point me in the right direction, pretty much. Um, so yeah, but he would have to, I wouldn't do it for no money. Denise, would you, would you be uh, open to coming back in something uh, 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 other than uh, other than me? <laughs> Something other than me. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, who would I be? Would I be Tasha? Would I be Sila? Be your granddaughter. Would, would, yeah, something in between, you know. Um, yeah, but of course it would be um, great fun to do. Great fun. See, just want to see if I can get in that space. Soon. Jonathan, does that intrigue? Does that intrigue? Uh, is there anything like I, that? I'm looking forward to discovery. Star Trek discovery. <laughs> You know, Jason Isaacs is the new captain. What? Jason, Jason, Jason Isaacs, Isaacs is the new captain, captain of the Enterprise. Who is? Yeah. Yeah, Jason, I Jason Isaacs. Yeah. I, I, I know nothing bridge. and have followed it less. Is it supposed to be good? Yeah. I, bet it's I haven't seen it. I bet it's going to be great. I bet it's going to be great. Well, well, we kind of hope it is. We're hoping it's, it's, like, it's part like of our legacy. Giant. It's got to, you know, I'm, I have an eternal optimist. Yeah. And, and I think it, it behooves it, yeah, I mean, it's good for everybody if it's, if it's good, because it goes on and on and on, and we're part of this giant epic that is the great American epic, Star Trek. And Remember how you felt when uh, Next Generation came out? Awful. Yeah, no. <laughs> we could all embrace that. <laughs> Just not too closely. <laughs> great. Yeah, you see, you got your answer. My dear, my, you got your answer. You next, my, my dear. Hi, so a lot of the allure of Star Trek for me is the way it envisions humanity moving forward and becoming united, and the ideals that the Federation holds 
uh, for humanity in general. I'm wondering, any of you guys, what do you wish that human us, real life, what we could take from that idea and turn it into something great for humanity? Ooh, wow. Uh, good question. This small I, let's go down the line. No, hold on. Let's go down the line. You, you should take that question and let's. It's a, it's, a, it's a serious enough question, but it, it, it'll take a lot of ideas. Well, not speaking as a Klingon, um, <laughs> I, I, I think the universality of, of Star Trek is built right in the starship itself. And, and, it's, and it's of every race, every alien group, every um, getting along. And if we can just do that on our own planet, and particularly right now in our own country, um, we might learn something from Star Trek that is a continuum, that you, not, you have to relearn every generation every time, and we're having to relearn it now. Uh, we just have to continue the spirit of Star Trek, which is the spirit of the Roddenberries, which is the spirit of, of mankind, is to keep it together and move forward, you know, and get together and get, you know, get along. I don't know if it, if it was Gene who said this or LeVar Burton, because I can't remember, but um, did he say no war, no, um, what was it, no war, no, uh, no, money. no money, and every child will be able to read and go to bed with a full tummy. You know, there should be, we are, you know, there should be, no, even in our own country, there are kids going to bed hungry, there are kids who can't read or write because their schools are so bad. We need to fix, we need to stop spending money on ridiculous shit and start looking after our own people. We don't need any more effing aircraft carriers. We really don't, we really don't. Listen, war is not going to be the same ever again. It's going to be cyber war. So spending money on, on actual hardware is ridiculous. And we need to tell our government that. This is a, um, a great um, question to pose on Earth Day, by the way. And happy Earth Day. And happy Science March Day. And there are rallies going on all over the country right now. Um, that science matters. And if there was ever a show, you know, that was emblematic of that, I think Star Trek really carries that through. I think we have to embrace science and embrace real facts, not alternative facts, but real proven things. And we have to make this place sacred. Our Earth is sacred. And without it, we got nothing. I don't care what your philosophical belief is. This is our planet. We need to take care of it. We need to treat it with the utmost grace and respect. Beautifully put. I couldn't agree with you more. Mother Earth. Mother. The mother. We must respect her. First and foremost, or all the rest of this won't matter. Absolutely. Yeah. in agreement and I, I think that as somebody who has ha actually I've, I've had my life saved by science um, and have been personally influenced by Star Trek uh, having microscopic surgery things like that the possibility of what can happen in the future if we put all of our humanity and intellect and um, energy into doing good and helping all of us. It would be amazing. And there's a small village that I, I sometimes am in in France, and the way they protect their water, their source, they have a source underground, is such an example of what we need to do for protecting water for all of us, because without water, without earth, we, we, it's true, we, there, is, there is nothing. And I also am a huge fan of space exploration, and I really would love to go up on one of those um, rockets and take a look at Earth from a new perspective. Aren't you going up? Thank you. Don't you have a ticket?
you're beautiful. What about you, Brett? I really disagree with everybody. <laughs> You know, there's nothing wrong with a cheap laugh, is there? You gotta go for it when you can, right? You know, I... Uh, you teed up. It was sitting there waiting for you. It just went, build it, build it, build it, build it, pay off. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know what? I, I it, it, in fact, uh, this is Science Day, right? It's, it's uh, Science March Day. Science March in Washington. They're having a big science huge, march. Huge, huge. All over the world. And, and, yeah. and, and I saw uh, online this morning a, uh, a poster somebody had in Washington at the Science March, and it said, uh, data, not lore. <laughs> That pretty much said it all. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, everybody um, on this panel from the TNG are so talented, multi-talented, every one of them. Uh, you hid behind those things, and you're a comic, and you're a singer, and you're a... I'm sort of every man. <laughs> and to, to, to finish it off for me, I, I, I agree with you all that... that what faces us is so awful, so awful, that we want to bury our heads and say it's not going to happen. It's going to happen, all right? The glaciers are going to melt. The currents are going to turn. The climate is going to change. We're in for a terrible time. To deny it and say it's not happening because it feels safer to do that for another 20 years, we have a chance of mitigating it all. But we have people that are governing us who are literally burying their heads in the sand. That's great. And it's up to us to change that course. Okay. Hello, my name is Stephen, and I have a question to the whole panel. I'm very nervous right now, so I'm going to mess this up. Please don't laugh at me. Um, so, for the whole panel, um, has there been a role that you guys have played that basically represents your personality very well? Basically, you just walked on, you're like, oh, this is me, basically. I can just be myself. Demona. Yeah! Demona on Gargoyles. They, I, that was a reference they, they got. I'm actually very shy and demure. <laughs> But I played a Klingon. <laughs> and my wife said, Yep, that's you. Actually, actually, there was an episode of Star Trek called The Loss, where Troy lost her powers. And when my husband watched it, he went, Honey, why is it that when Troy loses her powers, she becomes Marina? <laughs> Well, when he'd regained consciousness, I explained it to him. That's an, you know, you always, you have only your, your own experiences to draw on, you know, when you're, when you're doing a, a part. But for me, I mean, I am most interested in not being myself, like how far away from myself can I get? Because that's the interesting thing to me about acting. You know, I'm not really wanting to just be me in this, in this role. I'd rather create somebody entirely different. So I'm always trying to get as far away from myself. Not easy to do, you know, but that's the, the challenge for me in acting. That's a really good answer. <laughs> I've taken two of my good answers. Uh, sorry. What? You know, you no, 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 no. I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't going to say that. No, I, I will say this, though. I was never that good an actor. I was very lucky and tall. For sure. No, no, no. I'm not looking for that. And good looking. And, and incredibly very handsome. <laughs> I was always very grateful to play uh, Wild Bill Riker because the character was written with incredible uh, loyalty. 
But he was um, honest. Aww. He was. They touch. Uh, <laughs> he was intelligent. He was well organized. He had a sense of humor. He was articulate in a way that I wish I was as a man, and I was always very proud of uh, of, uh, of playing Wild Bill. Uh, what's his name? <laughs> William T. Riker. Number one. To be. Go ahead, Briggs. It's on you. Oh man, I, I don't. Uh, I don't know. You know, it's hard enough to get up in the morning and just play myself. So. <laughs> You know, I don't know. I, I, Have uh, you had the same problem? Yeah, man. So I don't, uh, I don't think of it in any particular role. Uh, I think there's parts of me in a lot of different roles, um, good, bad, and the ugly, and silly, and whatever. Um, so that's my answer. I think there's part of me in all of them, but I don't think there's one that I've gone, oh my God, that's me. Uh, it's more when I get up to brush my teeth in the morning and I go, oh my god, that's me, that's, that's when it's, that's when I, I, I look for that role somewhere. Um, well, I, I played myself on uh, Big Bang Theory, and, uh, that's peculiar though, isn't it? Yeah. Did you, you find it peculiar the character yourself? did you play Brent? Well, I, I, the character was Brent. Uh, I mean, he was called Brent Spiner, and uh, I had an inkling how to play it. Uh, but, you know, in fact, I did an episode of a, a show years ago called Joey. It was a spinoff of, yes. of Friends. And I also played the role of Brent Spiner on that show very, very well. And, uh, but I remember You did it well? Hey? Did it go well? Oh. Yeah. Okay. And I... Nailed it. I, I, I said to them, you know what, can we make him like a real jerk? And, and, and they said, what else? <laughs> well, the, the fact of the matter is, uh, like our imagination, we can't conceive of anything that's beyond our imagination. And so there are things out there beyond our imagination we can't imagine them. So when it comes to playing a role, we can't do more than the fact of uh, the the facets of our personality, and you might latch on to one of the things you remember you might have done slightly, and you're playing that. But in effect, you bring literally your body and your soul to the role, and you may emphasize something, but invariably, it's you. It's, it's a part of you, certainly. You know, our parts of you yes. make their way into whatever it is you're doing. Sure. Exactly. Next question. You good? You have what? You have a what? Follow up. No, 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 no. Can't be greedy. Got lots of people waiting in line. I'm very strict. Yeah. I wanted to hear his question. I, what? I no, no, no. There's lots of people waiting to ask a question. Yes, love. All right. Uh, I want to uh, welcome you first back to San Jose. For most of you, I think, have been here before. Um, and uh, I'd also like to in invite you to throw under the bus or the light rail uh, some of your cast members who aren't joining us for this session. <laughs> by, by telling an embarrassing story about those who haven't joined us today. What, what a weird person you are. <laughs> Why would you like to know something mean about someone? No, not mean. No. Not no, mean? Embarrassing. But throw, uh, lovely, lovely throw, under, throw under the bus has a connotation. But nicely. But nicely. Throw them under the bus. In the All bus. right, so I'm going to leave it up to you. You wish to throw somebody under the bus? I'm throwing the Bart Burton under the bus right now. <laughs> this week, I don't know, you, those of you who know me know that my passion is football. The real football, where they actually kick the ball with their feet. <laughs> Let me explain something to you really quickly in America. When you invent something, 
You get to name it. <laughs> and we invented football in England, okay? And we got to name it football. And just as this new country came along a couple of hundred years ago and developed a game where everyone throws the ball but the punter and the kicker, and they decided to call it football, doesn't mean that the English get to change the name of their national game. <laughs> Now I've got that off my chest. I just discovered LeVar Burton is an effing Arsenal supporter. <laughs> He's kept this secret for 30 years because I'm a Spurs fan and I hate Arsenal. And I found out on Twitter last week that he's an Arsenal fan and that's why he's not here today. <laughs> Because I'm going to rip his effing throat out when I see him. All right, I have one. So, uh, there, I think it was Descent where um, Captain Picard had become a Borg, right? And, right, okay. <laughs> hey, I just do them, I don't watch them. Yeah. And, and so he had been away for a while. They, there had been a lot of away team things happening, and, and you know, Dr. Crusher had been manning the captain's chair on the ship, which, you know, she liked. And um, <laughs> so I thought it would be funny. I thought this would really be funny when he comes back on Monday morning, when he comes back and he's on the ship and he's captain, he takes command from me. I thought it would be hilarious if I redecorated the bridge. So I got the props people and the set people to help me. And so um, I had pictures of Wesley Crusher. I did, I, I had a big champagne thing. I had all of these guys uh, with no shirts on controls. You know, and I was in curlers and a bathrobe, right? Because I wanted a more casual tone, but sexy, right? So. So anyway, so it's it's like seven when rehearsal was called, and I'm thinking he is going to love this, and or uh, you know the people who helped me were all like, oh my god, and Patrick walks in and he's nearsighted, <laughs> so he walks in and walks right up to me and goes, hi Gates, you know, let, let's start, you know, and I'm just like, and you know, like he thinks it's normal that I'm in a bathroom with curlers. <laughs> see anything else and it was so sad <laughs> that's very funny bro. it's really sad we could all tell sad stories <laughs> i'd like to tell the story about michael dorn yeah. getting his revenge on captain pecan the wackiest nut in the galaxy. <laughs> yes. You may recall the setup on the bridge of our enterprise had a horseshoe behind which Morf and Tasha stood. One day, Michael Dorn, to get his revenge on all of us who spoke to each other like this or spoke forward and never turned around to look at him <laughs> for seven seasons, showed up on the stage with a raw egg. He took the raw egg, he looked down at Old Baldy, he broke the egg on his head, and the albumin and the yolk dripped down Sir Patrick Stewart's face. Cracked eggshell on his skull. Fact or fiction? What? Why we do these I, panels, Bill? I we do these panels for these moments. I interviewed you, and he's saying, "Oh yeah, we we sing and dance between takes. We sang and you sang and dance between us." Oh, he said, "Oh, come on, Bill, you do it all the time, don't you?" I said, "No." <laughs> Who sings and dances on the? We yeah, do. Oh, well, that's right. <laughs> we like to have fun. Yes, we like to have fun. You know. So uh, wait a minute. What did Patrick do? Watch his face. Actually, it's so old baldy now. Seriously, what did he do? Were the, were the cameras rolling? No. But you know, uh, it is uh, in, in terms of having fun, it took us a while, famously, to get Patrick 
to have fun. Right. Uh, the first season he was, uh, well, he called a meeting. It's, it's a story he tells now on, on talk shows. Um, but he called a meeting because we were so rowdy and having too much fun. And uh, Denise, as I recall, said to him, but Patrick, we just want to have fun. No, no, she said, we're here for 18 hours a day sometimes. Yeah, she said, we're here for 18 hours a day. Yeah, we just want to have some fun. We're not here to have fun. <laughs> What he actually said was, and where, Denise, does it say in our contract that we're here to have fun? <laughs> I don't think I, I ever spoke to him again. I think that's line better. I just yeah, add more better, right? Can I throw Lavar Burton under the bus again? <laughs> this is going to be an ongoing thing now for the rest of my life. Um, in the episode where, uh, I think it was it, um, Chain of, no, which was the one where I got promoted? Remember when I got promoted and I had to take that test? By my own self, right? So, in that episode... <laughs> in that episode, do you remember, I had to send Geordie to his death to pass my test, right? So, the following episode, we're all sick. I'm just going to ignore this. The following episode... <laughs> I'm just, we're sitting in observation, and I looked across at LeVar, and I said, oh, you're only a lieutenant commander. I'm a commander. You have to call me sir. Yeah. And he goes, when did that happen? <laughs> and I went, last week, when I sent you to your death. <laughs> and he goes, oh, that's what that was about. <laughs> Which proved to me, LeVar Burton, come the fifth or sixth season, whenever that episode, sixth season, I think, whenever that episode was, was a bit like this when he got the script. Bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. My line. <laughs> I'll think of more. Because as I said, this is now my mission in life. In fairness, LeVar Burton is not here today because he's busy directing another captain, Mr. Scott Bakula, on NCIS New Orleans. Mr. Dorn is not here because he's playing Antony in Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra at the Orlando Shakespeare Company. Yeah. Patrick Stewart isn't here because he won't work with Phil. throwing me under the bus. <laughs> All right, that was fun. Man. <laughs> we didn't we didn't really like the question, and the question turned what? into a, that turned into a good cue. I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> She's not usually like that. You, you've got to forgive her. Yeah. She took some. <laughs> uh, SARS. Question, question. Yeah. Uh, first, I just want to thank each and every one of you for being part of one of the most wonderful shows on the, in, on the television. <laughs> uh, I appreciate all of you. Um, my question is for uh, Jonathan, Brent, and what would have been Marina. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you. Did you for me? Oh, thank you. Aww. Aww. Well, um, not, cheers, everyone. <laughs> now I'm gonna have a little bit of what she's been drinking. Um, so for it's Grandpa, <laughs> was that Bingo? That was Bingo. You having a little mini maid? No, no, that was Dean. What's your question? Oh, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> sorry wait, wait. Um, Brent, Jonathan, and Marina. Uh, last year, I was at Sacramento Comic Con with Greg Weissman, the creator of Gargoyles, and he says there's a movement to reboot Gargoyles, and I was wondering if you would ever reprise your roles. Yes. Yes, in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat, yeah. If we, uh, however, if they ever did live action Gargoyles, you know, we're too old to play the parts now. 
Unfortunately. Speak for yourself. As I know you do. I'm saving them up. <coughs> no, it's not going to be live action. It'll be a cartoon. Oh, sorry, animated series. Uh, so, so, so what is it? It's an animated series? Is that what it is? Yeah, it was three seasons and pretty much everyone who was on Star Trek ended up on it at some point as a guest star. <laughs> Except Dr. Crusher. Except Dr. Crusher. So I wasn't sad. a gargoyle. So sad. I don't. I wasn't. I didn't get to be a gargoyle. What? So sad. Is it about gar? <laughs> wow. I feel very left out. Now look what you did. <laughs> okay. Now. Well, if they do it again, I'm gonna. I'm gonna make a big push. Okay. I'm going to tell my agent, I'm going to call him right now, yeah, and I'm going to get on that damn show, so stay tuned. We're on it. We're on it. We're on it. It was a really good show. We can though. tour it. What? We can there, tour we, it. We're going to be in the tour. touring company of gargoyles. <laughs> 60 cities, baby. 60 cities. And I love every minute of it. I'll drive. I'll drive. Okay. You, you must be feeling good, yeah? Denise? You're feeling it? No, you're, you're oh, feeling good. I'm feeling great. You're yeah. feeling great. Oh God, I feel you're attacking the material. I, as I always do. Great. Have you got your hands? Feel good about that? My dear and your son. Thank you. Hi. Although I'm quite near to not to have another conversation with Brent and Jonathan again. <laughs> Hello, English person. <laughs> What's your name, darling? My name is Ethan. Ethan? You're not English. Hi, you sound American. No, English. He's English. Yeah. Check that accent immediately. <laughs> you've, lived, you've lived here a long time, right? Two years. Two years, and he's already sounding like a bloody yank. Okay. All right. <laughs> See, Ethan, I've been here for 30 years. I still sound like this. You have to, you have to be strong. Don't let them influence you. Right. Okay, love, yes. I was going to say, right near to have another chat with Brent and Jonathan and everybody. Your lovely co-stars um, helped me reminisce back in December about meeting you all after I gatecrashed the premiere party of First Contact in London. I wanted to thank you first off because one of the best moments, I went up to your table and I said, can I thank you, uh, can I congratulate you on the movie? And you went, did you like it? I said, I thought it was brilliant. And you went, sit down, sit down, sit down. And you let me sit at your table and... <laughs> you compliment me. I'm like Donald Trump. If you compliment me, I love you. You can be a mass murderer. I don't care. Say nice things. Bring me gifts. That's all I'm saying. Yes, sir. So, my, my question to you is, having been a fellow Brit that's moved over here, yeah. what was the hardest thing about leaving home and what do you still miss about the UK? I miss my friends. I miss my friends. I miss the English sense of humour. Yes. I do. <laughs> I get really sick of going, that was a joke. Because <laughs> you lot, I mean, I have to be honest, sometimes you lot don't get irony or sarcasm, actually. <laughs> Just saying. Um, but I miss, my, I, I, I miss football. I miss going to White Hart Lane every other Saturday. I do. And I miss English food. I know it sounds like an oxymoron. But um, we actually found crumpets. We found, yeah, I can find crumpets. There's an English pub near where I live, so I can get Marmite and stuff too. But yeah, I miss, I'm actually, I miss the English personality, is what I miss. And, and I've been, like I said, I've been here 30 years, and I'm very homesick, I have to be honest. Very homesick. Um, not saying I don't love this country. This country's been so good to me. Listen, in England, I was You don't know, like our personalities? In England, I was our, our American <laughs> personalities? What's that? We, we don't have any sense of humor, and, and we don't like All the Americans. Americans. I mean, no, we work together. I'm I have profits too. I, 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 I'm not saying you don't have a sense.
sense of humour, it's a different sense of humour. You are, you do have a sense of humour, it's just oh, not oh. the same as the English sense of humour. God, not lie me, honestly. <laughs> So sensitive. Anyway, my darling, that's what I miss. That's what I miss. Bless your heart. And by the way, you're English. Yes, I am English. Well, yeah, but... now, I'll tell you why you're English. Because only the English call themselves British. <laughs> right? Well, the first time I hear a Scotsman call themselves British, I'll call myself British. Right? <laughs> Just saying. Again. <laughs> I say, and I also met, uh, well, I scored um, William as well at the Generations um, premiere as well. So. Did you crash that too? No, I, I, I went, I actually um, had tickets to go to both the premieres, I just crashed the party up. You crashed the party? Ago. Excellent. <laughs> they made a movie about someone like you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, you can... Okay. I'd like to just challenge this football thing you're talking about. I mean, I watch English football and they scramble around, people get piled on, the ball mysteriously is, a, appears, somebody picks it up, runs... That's rugby, darling, that's rugby. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> uh, for, first of all, I just want to say that I love football and soccer. Um, <laughs> Did they not tell you not to piss me off? <laughs> well, I figure you don't have a water bottle in your hand, so I'm fairly safe for right now. <laughs> Anyhow, I think that uh, we can all say that the degree of success Star Trek has uh, established for itself can be seen in the cultural references that have bled out through our society in general, specifically for this show. Um, so I have basically two questions. Number one, Brent, are you still selling data action figures on a back out of the trunk of the car? <laughs> now the secret is out. I could make you a deal on a... on a gross of them, if you'd like. You, you gonna to come to my birthday party too? No. No. <laughs> you draw the line somewhere. You've got to, right? And then a, a question for the group in general. You folks get bombarded by us, the fans, with questions, with queries, with everything. Um, and sometimes it's hard for us to separate the people that we love from the show with the people who play them. Uh, talking with Miss Crosby last night. I had no idea. She was nothing like Tasha Yar, and she isn't. She's a very warm human being. I, mean. I didn't know that. <laughs> but if you had a personal message that you would want to share with the fans, what would that be? I thought. Uh, personal message to share with the fans. Uh, please, Brent, you, uh, Brent, you do the, the, the honors. Sir. Can I tell you in private? <laughs> with an action figure in your hand? Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's too personal. I, I you know, uh, I, I have, uh, I, well, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by uh, a personal message for, I mean, I see you, I don't see you as one collective unit. Uh, I sort of see you individually as people and, um, some of you were fantastic, and others, eh. But, uh, <laughs> but most are fantastic uh, in this room. <laughs> Take it, Gates. I'm done. I Go ahead, Gates. Do you have a personal? I don't have a... Uh, I have a personal message. Yeah, I actually I have one. I, 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 have a, I have a personal... I do have a personal message. While they're talking... That was for all of you. <laughs> On all your behalf. Just, it's just too personal to share. But... What did she say? It was 
a personal message. <laughs> Dr. Crusher. <laughs> okay, I'll do the personal message for all of us, because it applies to all of us. Um, and I usually do this at the end, but as, we're, as you ask the question now. Sometimes people in show business forget why we have all the blessings that, that we do in our lives. And trust me, we have lovely lives. We have lovely lives. And we owe it to the people who turned on their TV sets for seven years, paid money to go and see three and a half movies. Because <laughs> it's your fault we were canceled, to be honest. <laughs> We just didn't go and see Nemesis enough, right? <laughs> uh, but we owe everything that we have to you. And not individually, I mean, yes, individually, but as a group, you kept us on the air for seven years. You have given us our houses, our cars, our families sometimes because, you know, of living in LA. Um, like I said, we owe everything to you. And God bless you all because. Um, I don't think we'll ever, ever be able to pay you all back. <laughs> and uh, I, I'll end this with um, just fear. characters on The Next Generation, and I really found a way to be comfortable with what was different about myself. Um, Deanna Troy was my favorite character because she was so sensitive, and I was so sensitive. I felt everything around me, and I loved Data and just his beautiful longing for humanity. And I just wonder if any of you had that experience or have had that experience of a character that has touched something in yourself and inspired you to be proud of it. Before we answer this question, can I just say, you are so bloody smart in San Jose. <laughs> question that we've much. never been asked Great before. Why don't you a answer the question? What did she say? Oh, I think she said after she said she loved me. No, 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 no. Um, a character, it wasn't so much a character for me, um, there were two actresses that I looked up to when I was, when was young that, you know, inspired me, and they were Betty Davis and Greta Garbo, and, because I'm really old, um, so I understand how you could be inspired by something, um, the, we, I think we hear this a lot, that we helped people. Listen, this is what I think we all agree blows our minds, the fact that people come up to us and say this to us. Um, Johnny, why don't you tell the story of what happened in um, when we were doing a thing with Bill a few years ago with feet. Were you there? Because <laughs> I'm talking a lot, so I want someone else to talk. Feet? Yeah, Gates, you tell the story then, you remember. Um, He's having a senior actually, moment. Can I answer the question? Gentlemen, you join in with, when your mind collect, uh, connects you. Uh, um, a character that actually was super, super important in my own life was the mouse in Dumbo. Because I felt a lot like Dumbo. And I love that mouse. And I used to watch it and watch it and watch it, and I thought it was just unbelievable. And I, it was the first 
It was the first movie I ever showed my son. And I, uh, he hadn't seen any media at all until he was three. And he sat and he watched Dumbo. And um, it, was, it was pretty amazing <laughs> just to have that experience. And so I understand how powerful something can be when you project onto it, because I had been doing that since a little girl. And then as an adult, to watch it again with my son was pretty, pretty amazing. And I think it's one of the most beautiful stories, because it's, you know, Dumbo didn't lose his mother, which happens in just so many other Disney things when I was young. And, uh, and it was about friendship, and it was about helping each other and believing in your friend and, um, and doing the impossible, which I really think is an awesome thing to think about. And especially we need to think about it today, because there's a lot of problems in the world that seem impossible, but, you know, we have to collectively find our, um, find trust in each other and work together. Anyway. That's exactly what Pete did for us. We were at a convention, all of us together, and there was a gentleman, an Afghan vet, who had lost both of his legs. Right, I remember that. And he said that tape, or whatever they did, was what allowed him to carry on. And he stood up. On 150 his... surgeries. Yeah. Yes. And he yeah. stood up on his stumps in his wheelchair, and he cheered us in a way that was so moving and unforgettable. And it, 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 it's the, it's sort of the microcosm of the power of the show and the power of Gene's vision and the blessing that we all have that we've been able to share. And for him to, to thank us in that way it was, it was a yeah, that was an incredible moment. Uh, oh, thank you, Mr. Gold. I'm glad he's here. Yeah, that was a remarkable moment. Uh, was astounding. Talked over the years about how uh, uh, one or another of the of the Star Trek shows has uh, entertained them and made them feel better. It it, it certainly is a it, there's a glow that's uh, almost indescribable uh, from people like that who've suffered and offered so much. Yes. Sorry for the. SNL shout, I was just so excited. My name's Daniel. Well, wait a minute, wait, with the SNL shower, did you say? <laughs> Not exactly, I, I was just so excited to meet you guys. And here's a question. If this is possible for a great Star Trek title, the origin of the Borg. I mean, think about it. What was their first plan? How did the Federation react? And what did they do to fight back when they first encountered them? Have, you, the written, have you written it? Uh, no, I just thought of it. it <laughs> I, 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 I put it in a little more detail if I were you. Get this oh, man a typewriter! <laughs> Wait, what's a typewriter? <laughs> well, well, have you got a question? Well, that is the question. Yeah, I guess it's a great title. Uh, well, the great title is, what's the question? What to be? I would suggest you send an email to J.J. Abrams. <laughs> Because we don't have anything to do with that anymore. Well, yeah. that was just a possible thought. And yeah, no, it's well, a good, it's good idea. idea. It's a good idea. It's just 20 years late, is it? <laughs> yeah. You good? Yeah. Thank you. We could do, we could do uh, the orange of the board. <laughs> orange is the new board. <laughs> orange is the new board. And you know who it'll be about. We had to go there, right? You know who it'll be about our, our president. <laughs> I turned 50 years old this year, Aww. so I grew up with Star Trek. My first exposure was at the age of five. I saw Devil in the Dark, and I watched Captain Kirk, and I'm like, I want to be like that guy. That's who I want to be like. And so he I would never wear a shirt like that. That's okay. <laughs> I, so I've been teaching kindergarten for most of the last 30 years, and I have to tell you that dealing with five-year-olds is a lot like Devil in the Dark. It's like you approach these horrible creatures, and then you have to figure out that they're actually warm, 
compassionate people underneath. It's, it's an amazing thing. So all of you inspire me every day in my teaching, and my question to you is, is similar to what was asked earlier, but in your travels around the world, I'm wondering if you have observed or discovered communities or cities or projects that you feel are embodying Star Trek values today. If you could share some of that, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Nothing. Uh, <laughs> well, that, um, that's interesting. Uh, you've, you've, you've moved around the world the last uh, several years. Uh, communities of any kind that you came across? Okay, anywhere? okay, I've got one. In Greece, in Greece right now. Um, because of the Germans. I'm sorry to all you Germans out there, but I'm a bit off you right now. Um, because of what they're doing to Greece, the Germans are really destroying Greece, their financial minister. Um, why are you laughing at? That's not funny. Don't make me come down there. Um, basically what's happening in Greece right now is that the community has come together. Um, every supermarket, people are starving. The uh, pension in Greece now is 350 euro a month, which doesn't even pay your rent. Um, people are starving. Um, begging. We never had beggars on the street in Greece. Maybe a blind guy outside the church, but never everywhere. Um, and, the, and the community in Athens is helping. The community. Every supermarket has a big metal bin in the front so you can donate food. Um, all the refugees who are in the country that can least afford to feed them, let's not forget, the Syrian refugees are in Greece. Greece is broke, right? And yet the people, the Greeks, are feeding these refugees. The public. Because the government can't afford it. So there is right now a country that is doing exactly what Gene Roddenberry envisaged. We're taking care of each other because the government can't afford it. Um. And, and needless to say, your background is Greek. It is. And there are 50,000 Syrian refugees in Greece right now. Wow. Horrible That's conditions. Something. Well, you know, there are communities all over the world that dedicate themselves to goodness and, and to humanity and the essence of them. They rely on other people to feed them. Uh, the monks, uh, the, the Jains in, uh, in India. And, uh, there, there are pockets of people who dedicate themselves to goodness. There resides in all of us that element of goodness, and it just needs to be tapped. We're so buffeted by our needs and survival that that element of goodness sometimes is lost, but it's there, and we need to tap into it. And I'm also very impressed with places like the Jet Propulsion Lab uh, in uh, Los Angeles. I feel there is such an extraordinary community when I visited. I just, I'm so impressed by all of the, the people working together for uh, exploration into space and trying to make our lives better with the technology that's discovered. I feel there are places like that that are all over the world. Well, and there, there are uh, individual, uh, individuals right now uh, I put on a, uh, a charity horse show. Uh, it'll be on uh, June. We know, the, we've been. The Hollywood Charity Horse Show. And every year I've gotten a name performer. And this year uh, I, I, I've been unable to connect. The name performer doesn't need anything from me. But out of the goodness of their heart, they're willing to come away from their home, spend. Uh, 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 a flight and an evening in Los Angeles and fly back, they're giving themselves on an individual basis. And I, I'm dealing with that right now. Uh, that individual who will give of themselves. And it's all an individual act anyway. Can we ask who it is? Are you fill in? Can we ask who the individual is? Well, I, everybody. I, 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 I've... Uh, 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 you know who you should ask? Brad Paisley is a... Brad Paisley, that's what yeah. I was going to say. Brad Paisley, Brad Paisley you should get Brad... a friend of mine. I know. And, and, uh, and I've, I've I'll stopped. come if Brad Paisley's playing. 
Fred I'll recently has failed me. It's, he's failed you. <laughs> My good friend. But we're getting somebody now okay. for our licensing. Anyway, what I'm saying, it's an individual act. Well, I have to quick story about Brad Paisley and Bill Shatner. They're good friends. You are good friends with Brad Paisley, aren't you? And Brad, we, I can't remember which convention we were at. Nashville. Was it Nashville? Yeah, it must have been Nashville, obviously, right. And um, Brad wanted to come and see Bill at the convention. So he came in disguise as Obi-Wan Kenobi, <laughs> right? And he brought his kids who were, you know, dressed up, but he could wander around the convention floor and no one knew who he was because he had a mask and the hood and the cowl and everything and it was brilliant. He came into the green room and I nearly peed myself. Well, it's, it's the imagination that science fiction catches uh, with you. The, uh, I uh, finished uh, a series of interviews with uh, astrophysicists uh, lately, uh, ending up with um, Stephen Hawking. I interviewed Stephen Hawking. The Hawk? Even I know him. He went to dinner. Went to his house for dinner. Did you? Stephen Hawking, yeah. yeah. Uh, I want you to run your mind over having dinner with a gentleman who can't talk. I did a scene with him. On, he was on our show. You, you remember He was that, on our so. show, Bill. Oh, well, yeah, about well, that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you meet him? Yeah, so I, I was in the... Did you talk with him? Uh, as best I could. Yeah, you know, I mean, played you know, poker with him. I played poker with him. You played poker with him? Yeah. You played poker with Stephen Hawking? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't, uh, I didn't dine with him. Uh, you did. Who did, could? Did you win? No, he won. <laughs> In any case, uh, astrophysicists write science fiction in essence, and they make it sound like it's real by their mathematics, but they're writing science fiction. It captures all of us science fiction, and that's what we're doing. All the people in all their guises thinking what's out there and what could happen and who might it be and who could save us and, and where did we come from and is it possible there's life out there? And the mystery. Next question. Question for the ladies. Um, first, I know that at, during the casting, um, Denise was going to play Troy and Marina was going to play Yar. Now, had that happened, do you think you could have played? How would you have played Troy during the entire run and the films, different from what Mar Marina did? And how You're not going to make me answer that. Right. I'm not going to touch that question in a tinfoil pool. No way. Kidding. That's a trick question. Yeah. Mess me up, dude. No. Um, but is that true? Well, I, it wasn't that I was going to play Troy and she was going to play Tasha. In the original casting sessions, I mean, I, I think I had to read for this part like five times, you know, before um, I finally got the role of Tasha. But it originally started out, I was given the um, role of Troy to audition for. I think I, I read for the part of Troy twice. Three times. <laughs> she would know how many times I read for the part of Troy. So, um, I saw you at the auditions every time. Well, n the, okay. Whatever. Anyway, so, um, something like that. So, um, and then uh, finally my final reading was in a room with um, producers and writers and, and Jean as Troy. And he said, you know, I just want to give you the part of, to look at of Tasha. And I said, okay, great, you know, fine. And go leave and come back and, and read for that. And, you know, that's how it, it switched out. But there was no script. I mean, we had no script. I never saw a full script um, for any of these. So I had no idea. It didn't matter what Troy was or what Tasha was. I still, I was making it up as I went, you know? And, and even when, when I auditioned, I came into the room, I think I was the first female who auditioned. I came into the room, they did not tell me what part. I came into the room, they said there's three roles. You can go up for any role you want. So I read the three roles and there was a scene of Crusher coming on to Picard with the virus and I thought, oh, she's going to be the comic character. <laughs> Wrong. But that's the one I picked because I thought she was going to be funny, and I, that's what I auditioned with, so that, and then I never looked back. That was my only funny scene in seven seasons. <laughs>
Well, at least you got one. And the reason. <laughs> The reason, they're actually, the She's reason bad. why we were auditioning for each other's roles at the beginning was the character description. Troy was supposed to be blonde and Tasha was supposed to be dark. And it was purely that. Yeah, it was, it was you know, they envisioned, I remember they, I said, you know, what is a, she's a, she's a beta, beta, beta zoid. She's a beta zoid. What's a beta zoid? Well, just think of her as Norwegian. <laughs> That was Junie Lowry telling, you know, really? telling me that. Yeah. Norwegian? Yeah, Scandinavian. She's like, a, you know, an ice queen. Scandinavian ice queen. Whatever that is. <laughs> great, thanks. And then they cast me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They have no clue what they want, really. They don't. But you know that actually, uh, this is true. I, when I came into audition for Data, uh, I was sitting, I was waiting to go into the room, and Judy Lowry, the casting director, came out and said, uh, they think they might want you to read for Riker instead. <laughs> Seriously. And I said, Riker? Who wants to play Riker? <laughs> what time did you go to work in the morning? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. No, but that, that you know, at, the point is, they really didn't know what they wanted at all for anyone. And, um, because uh, they had uh, a lot of people reading from the card mm -hmm. who were extremely different from Patrick. Oh, yeah. yeah. They made Patrick audition uh, with his wig on. Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. I Bo, did not know that. Bo Svensson auditioned for Picard. Well, that was that whole Scandinavian thing they were no, doing. No, it's, it's the Scandinavian thing. He was in that loop. Yeah. <laughs> We were gonna. Can you imagine if it was Bo Svensson? <laughs> Are we good? I'll be sitting here yeah. today. Go ahead. Um, first off, I just want to say thank you for the impact all of you have had in my life. You guys are outside of my parents. You guys were like my positive role models. So thank you for that. Um, so my question is: is um, the I wanted to ask you about how TV is today. Uh, the next generation, your show, it's just, it, it, the dialogue is so smart and so sophisticated and you dealt with such adult topics. Um, do you feel like there's a TV sh and the original series too, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just drifted off for a moment. I was... <laughs> do, um, do you feel like a show like that belongs, right, can, is there a place for a show like that? on today's TV where everything is just, you know, streamed, you know, binge watch, I got a, you know, 12 episodes come out and I watched all 12 in, you know, in a two hour break. Um, do, do you, I mean, my, I guess, like, what are your thoughts of that? Is it, you know, is that even possible? Because your show kind of had, you know, a little bit of a rough start and we were there with you and then we saw it grow into something beautiful um, and great. And, I mean, the stadium being full is a testament to that. So, um, yeah, I was just wondering what your thoughts are on what how TV on the, is like on, today. On the modern way of uh, doing television? Yeah. I think television has never been better. I agree. Oh. I think yeah. the writing is brilliant. I love the fact that we can download a season of Fargo at the end or House uh, of Cards. Cards. Yeah. Or, or any of, of oh, any man. 50 or Ray 60 Donovan. great shows on the air right now. That's, it's unprecedented. I mean, they talk about the golden age of television, which was the Norman Lear years, the Mary Tyler Moore, the, that, that era. But really, right now, it's the platinum age of television. It's, it's overwhelmingly great, I think. There's too much great stuff to watch. You, can't, you don't have time for it all. And you so, get immersed when you watch, uh, you know, several episodes. Where, where would uh, the next generation have fit the deal? Well, I think that the people who are being introduced to next generation now who are, are watching it, are watching it, are binge way. watching it. Yeah. And the, the fact is, it, it's the best way to watch it because of the fact that there is so much to watch. You have to be able to watch it fast and, and absorb it all fast because you want to get on to the next one. There's so much good stuff out there right now. So basically, we disagree with you. <laughs> yes, sir. You. Yes. Uh, hello. Are you uh, looking at your image? Here. Is that it? Yes. Look, yeah, take the time. Here. Look up. Look up there. There you go. Look, look how good you look. Nice. Okay. Yeah, but look at this guy this next is, to you. 
a series of artworks yes. of everybody who's on this panel right now. I've yes. written some interesting quotes on there from the characters. Yes. This is my brother, Mr. Frakes. He dresses you. That's uh, so fantastic. Oh, yeah. So great. Look at this. Yeah. How old are you? I'm 12. You're 12. Your you beard looks like right amazing. It looks right now. Thank you. Uh, it looks so. You, you must. You've got a big beard for a twelve-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> but you'll see, grow into it. See, no, I watched the show, and I've watched it enough times to realize two things about my image. It's okay to be totally bald from Picard, and it's okay to have a rockin' beard like Riker. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's okay to be pasty too. It is so. definitely. Fine to be on well, when you can lift a whole bunch of things and be super strong, it's okay to be pasty, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so let me get to our questions. So, my question is, um, when you were making the show, over the course of that, did you ever have like an episode where you realized, wow, we're really making something really great? Or did you have an episode where you were like, this is, uh, this is not so great? <laughs> my brother's gonna ask his question now itself too, as like a combo thing. We had a not so great episode, the, uh... Right when Tasha was treated... Is he taking a yeah. selfie now? Racist. No, I'm taking a video. He will take a video. By the way, you're not allowed are, to... Are you going to ask a question, young man? Oh, he's got a video? Yeah. Go ahead, right um, <laughs> How did you feel when you were picked for these roles? Okay. So, did you ever have a, uh, a feeling that the script wasn't quite good? Yeah, it was called Naked Now, was it? Not no, the, it was called no, the Naked Now. No, no, it was called Code of Honor. Code of Honor. Code of Honor. Code of Honor. Code and of we honor. had a real stinker. Really. <laughs> yeah, a, a real one. First season. We had a real, real... First season. Crazy. First season was dicey. Uh, misogynist dicey. and racist and... Right. And, right. Uh, and, this was and, Angel and, 1. And did you have a season that went bad or just a... One or two shows, a half a dozen shows. There were a couple on the first worked. season I, I felt were questionable. Absolutely. I, I think we had a, a fairly good average through the years. We would do, I would say, because we were doing 26 episodes a season. Nobody does that anymore. But we did at least six of them were really good. And, uh... <laughs> no, that's pretty darn good. Yeah, you know, yeah. really. And, and, and maybe another 15 were yeah, pretty good. And, uh... And then four or five were really horrible. Uh, and those are the ones I remember the most. Yeah, oddly enough, as well. Absolutely. Well, uh, the, uh, the ones you remember, were you in them? Or no, no, I was able to watch those watch them. because I wasn't yeah, in them. Yeah, 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 exactly. I starred in all of them. Oh, you <laughs> all the bad ones. Oh, yeah. Really? Pretty much. Be, <laughs> your demise and well, sending people I, into a pool of uh, Metamucil. Or what, yeah. And what was the one where you ran around jogging all Haven. the time? Haven. Oh, yeah. that. No, no. Huh? Haven was Rob Necker. What was Haven was not. Angel One. Oh, Angel One. Angel One was bad. Angel One was bad. Oh, the outfits all were the women, unbelievable. All they really wanted was him. Yeah. <laughs> Angel One. Do you remember that? Do you remember? I had my, my nipples exposed in Angel One. Does <laughs> that so, recall? I mean, I love Riker as much as the next person, but there's this planet that's been run by women for all eternity, right? And okay, the boys are dressed in ballerina outfits, but that's the way they dress, okay? And then Riker comes down, and he makes one speech, and they decide to change their form of government. <laughs> Back to the earlier question, the writing for Riker was fantastic. It was Logical. <laughs> Logical. <laughs> That's wild. Uh, How did we feel when we got the job? <laughs> What'd she say? Do you want to take that? How did you feel? We were happy. We were happy to be employed. Yeah. The rent. <laughs> We finally could pay the rent. The rent was being paid. That's how I felt. And, and that was before you got the role. Yeah. I love a dance. What's yeah. your question? Go yeah, man. So back in 87 through 91, you guys came to a small town called San Jose to a little convention called TimeCon, which I'm sure some of the people here have also been to. Uh, unfortunately, I was small enough that I have very little memories of that 
those years. So thank you for coming back and giving me new memories. Glad to be here. So one of my one of the things that's really cool about your show uh, was that all of your all of the actors' talents outside of their normal characters' lives um, could be explored every now and then, um, mostly through the holodeck and various other means. And one of my favorite scenes or storylines is when Crusher teaches Data how to dance. So I was wondering if you could share any stories about that that scene in particular or any other similar uh, filming days where you got to really stretch your legs, so to speak. Are we yeah. just talking about that on Twitter? <laughs> on Twitter. And I noticed what you said. That was funny. Yeah, well, so Brent, why don't you show them? Well, no, no, I... I... Brent was saying how, how hard it was to teach me how to tap dance, and I wanted to just, like, let's, you know. Uh, I, you know what? Yeah, She's right. She's a bad student. <laughs> she really is. Uh, no, no. She was the choreographer. She taught me, well, well taught me that everything, routine. Everything, basically. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. But as I said uh, yesterday, is everything she did, I did uh, backwards and in heels. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> But it, it really was fun, actually. Uh, oh, we had a great time. It yeah, was a did. fun it was, it was It was so much fun. We actually got to play around and do little things and find little bits. So it was it was fabulous. And uh, I was uh, I was getting very pregnant. People thought I was just getting fat, but in fact uh, I was getting fat. But there was a reason. Uh, but that was a that was an especially fun episode. That's all we have to share. Yeah. And when he does it, there was a guy who I cast who was a phenomenal tap dancer. Right. And he's the one who does, did the stuff that then got speeded up. I mean, he was phenomenal. Um, but, but parts of it are me. Yeah, parts of it. Are me. You know, what if, what if, this is a completely, you know, segue here, but w along those lines, one of my favorite parts of the first season, too, was the fact that Johnny and I had to do Aikido. <laughs> they, the producers decided that the two of us would learn Aikido. Just in case we had to, you know, flip someone on the bridge, you know, or at least carry within our body language, you know, a certain um, skill, a certain warrior-like skill. Practicing Aikido with this man, I never had a dry uniform after, I mean, I, when it was... that exactly correctly. No, 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 you go ahead, the story just got better. This? Well, everyone else got to have these fabulous lunches. No, it wasn't or lunches. Nap. Yeah, yeah. We could not eat. We had to get out of our little spacesuits and into our geese. And twice a week on a sound stage that wasn't being used, we had an Aikido master come for an hour and beat the shit out of us. <laughs> Johnny and I. And he'd make us flip each other, and he could never flip me. He was laughing too hard. I always flipped him. So and I was, I, 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 I was like, an, I, I was like an eel. <laughs> I was a slithering eel. But in it time, it's, it's serving very well. Yes. They're very warm. Yeah, very. Still you very know, Oh, oh, wonderful. That, that's a great story. Listen, everybody, Let's take his what a beautiful audience you are. Nobody in this long hour and a half got up and left. It was just lovely being with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.